Last Stand movies. Movies where a group of people barricade themselves inside of a building and fight off whatever's attacking them. Usually this is the setting for an apocalyptic scenario in that these few people could be the last survivors of the human race. The enemy has been everything from zombies, to vampires, to werewolves, to sentient machines, to demons. But this week throws a bit of a curveball with humans possessed by really pissed off angels. Legion's a 2009 action horror film directed by Scott Stewart. The movie opens with a voiceover explaining that God has had it just about up to year with us lousy humans and is ready to bring on the apocalypse. One night I finally got the courage to ask my mother why I got it changed, why he was so mad at his children. I don't know, she said, tucking the covers around me. I guess he just got tired of all the bullshit. I think this is what finally drove him over the edge. In Los Angeles, the Archangel Michael falls from heaven. He cuts off his wings, which makes him mortal, and his metal halo falls off. I didn't know God was into BDSM. He breaks into a toy store, which has a giant matrix gun locker. Realizing he's locked in the store, he blows the front of the building out to escape. He could have just taken the keys from the security guard he knocked out, but nah, this is way cooler. Some cops are driving by and they try to arrest him, but one of them is possessed or he's having a seizure. Michael kills the demon cop and steals their police car. As he drives away, all the power in town goes out. Over in the Mojave Desert, a guy named Jeep is having a nightmare. Jeep? Really? Anyway, Jeep works for his father, Bob, at Paradise Falls, a diner slash garage. Jeep's in love with Charlie, a waitress at the diner who's pregnant but doesn't know who the father is. Charlie wants to give the baby up for adoption, but Jeep wants her to keep it so they can raise it together. Jeep is kind of an idiot. He's supposed to be this brooding hero, but let's see what's really going on inside of his head. The next day, Bob is trying to work his Fonzie magic on the TV. The one-armed cook, Percy, is telling him, uh, what was I talking about? Really, how can she go out in public looking like that? Well, you go out in public looking like that. Howard and Sandra, along with their daughter Audrey, are stuck at the diner because their car broke down. Jeep is supposed to be working on the car, but he's busy polishing a crib for Charlie that he found in a junk pile. Kyle's lost in the desert on the way to see his son. This is not the music I would have expected him to be listening to. He stops at the diner to ask Mother of the Year candidate Charlie for directions. Kyle then proceeds to ask Charlie if they serve food in a diner. They got anything in there to eat? Pancakes? Or... Jeep goes to work on the car, but remembers... He's an idiot. Bob gets the TV to work, but it's running a message from the emergency broadcast system. What the hell is that? It's uh, one of them test things. Yes, this is one of those tests that clearly says that this is not a test. Kyle tries to use the phone to talk to his son, and then he is never mentioned again. Creepy old lady Gladys stops at the diner and proceeds to be a complete Jesus freak. <laughs> but what about the baby? I got it under control. But it's gonna burn. What'd you just say? I said your fucking baby's gonna burn. And now she's channeling Betty White. Gladys, um... Shut up, you stupid fucking cunt. All you do is complain, complain, complain. Howard confronts her and she takes a nice chunk out of him. Percy throws a frying pan and scores a direct hit on Granny. The hell medication they have this lady on. Jeep tries to shoot her, but he chickens out, so Kyle shoots her. Howard's bleeding out, so Kyle puts his scarf on the wound that magically turns into a napkin. They load Howard into Kyle's car to rush him to the hospital. While on the way there, they run into this huge swarm of flies. The group makes it back to the diner and locks themselves inside to avoid the swarm. After the swarm passes, they dump Gladys' body outside, just in time to see Michael drive up. Bob confronts Michael. After convincing them that he's on their side, Michael gives them all guns. Hold on. I don't think that's such a good idea. Dad, I can handle it. I don't think he can handle it. He seems like the kind of guy that would accidentally shoot someone on his own team. So they go back to the diner and barricade themselves inside. Oh man, the apocalypse is here? Good, now I don't have to worry about fixing that car. Michael takes them to the roof to wait for the horde to arrive. The first thing to arrive is the ice cream man. Well, this apocalypse isn't going to be so bad after all. Honey, listen. It's the ice cream man. 
Could you get me one of those Spider-Man popsicles? The one with the gumball eyes. The ice cream man gets out and, of course, is disturbing. Oh, man, he don't look that bad. Oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Get ready. Get ready? Why not just shoot him while he's standing still? Oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, oh, uh, well, um, all things considered, uh, they killed it pretty easy. Off in the distance, hundreds of cars are closing in. The drivers look like they're auditioning for a tool video. They shoot the possessed people, which are comprised of men, women, and even children. Uh, damn demon kids. One of the demons gets inside and takes Howard. The Horde decides to give the group a break so Michael can explain what's going on. You know, you could be boarding up the windows while all this is going on. Michael explains that the people aren't possessed by demons, but by angels. Michael then tells Charlie that her child has to live or mankind is doomed. Hey look, they're boarding up the windows finally! Michael explains to Jeep that he's there because he disobeyed a direct order from God. He then tells him that he's one of the true heroes of mankind and is the reason he still has faith. You, Jeep. You are the reason I still have faith. Hey guys, what's going on? Duh. Michael's thinking back to an argument he had with the angel Gabriel while he was still in heaven. Gabriel wants to destroy mankind while Michael wants to save it. Sandra sees Howard tied to an inverted cross, so she goes outside to try to save him. Kyle tries to stop her, but is a complete wimp and she knocks him out. Sandra runs out and Percy saves her from her husband, who pops like a giant zit that melts his back off. Audrey is talking to Kyle about her family. No, when I was a shorty. What? No, when I was a shorty. I refuse to take anything he says for the rest of the film seriously. The power comes back on as the next wave of angels shows up. Kyle goes to rescue a little kid, but of course... <laughs> Audrey tries to save him even though he's already dead, but runs out of ammo so she hides in the van. Do angels not understand how to break glass? Michael goes out to rescue her. The possessed kid gets inside the diner. He tries to kill Charlie, but she kicks him off and Jeep shoots him. Charlie goes into labor and delivers the baby in about two minutes. Michael tells Charlie that she just gave birth to John Connor. And now at least the child will have a chance to grow up. A chance to lead the world out of darkness. She wants nothing to do with the baby, so Audrey takes him to show her mom. I remember when you were a baby. Don't you mean, I remember when you were a shorty? Do ya hear how stupid that sounds? Horns are blazing to announce the arrival of the angel Gabriel. Sandra stills the baby to give to the angels so they'll let them live. Michael shoots her and she drops the baby. It's a long pass, Jeep goes in for the catch and touchdown! Gabriel is not messing around. Gabriel spins around and kills Bob. Jeep, Audrey, Charlie, and the baby escape out the back while Michael holds off Gabriel. The two stare lovingly at each other like they're gonna start making out at any moment. And then they break into a super badass fight. Gabriel manages to kill Michael, who then disappears. With Michael dead, all of the inscriptions on him transfer to Jeep. Bob was still alive and he blows up the diner. Gabriel goes after the group and tries to kill the baby. Audrey holds Gabriel and Jeep hits the brakes so they smash out the windshield. Charlie and Jeep try to run away from Gabriel. Gabriel easily knocks out our great hero Jeep. Michael shows up freshly reborn from heaven in time to stop Gabriel. Michael then tells Jeep he's the true protector of the baby. Where are you going? You're the true protector. You always have been. Will we ever see you again? Have faith. They head to a local town that also survived the angel onslaught. Jeep drives off into the sunset in, surprise, a Jeep Wagoneer. Jeep, the official car of the pissed off angel apocalypse. The movie was filmed mostly in Galisteo, New Mexico for about $26 million. For such an effects-heavy film, they had a very short schedule. They used as many practical effects as they could and resorted to CGI to enhance them, such as the scene with Gladys. They had a stunt woman on a track on the ceiling and used CGI to remove the tracks and wires. Although the part with her climbing the wall like an insect was all animated. The baby was also animatronic, and the first day they brought it to set, the actress thought it was real. The Ice Cream Man was really pushed to be an iconic character in the movie. They spent a lot of time working on him to make him as memorable as possible. The first step was getting the outstanding Doug Jones to play him. They put him in the outfit and had fake spider legs while his real legs were covered in green, so they could be removed in post. His arms were actually prosthetics that were pushed into frame. They enhanced the arms with CGI to make them appear more elastic. A shame all this work went into a character that essentially showed up, was creepy, and then died. The swarm of flies in the distance was several matte paintings while the flies in the car were CGI. 
The cast in the film was terrific. Dennis Quaid, John Tenney, Tyrese Gibson, Adriana Palicki, and Kate Walsh were all solid, but Charles S. Dutton knocked it out of the park as usual. That guy is good in everything. Kevin Durant was great as Gabriel, and even though his part was small, he made his presence felt. Paul Bettany was badass as Michael. He brought the right amount of charisma to the role, and made the film that much more entertaining. He even did most of his own stunts. He worked with director Scott Stewart again in 2011 in The Awesome Priest, which was a movie I covered last year. The only weak link was Lucas Black, who played Jeep. I just didn't feel his character at all. I know he was supposed to be this sympathetic character who rises to the occasion to be the hero in the end, but the whole movie, he just felt like a dope. Director Scott Stewart has a background in visual effects and worked for ILM for four years before leaving to start his own company. This was his first movie, and it was his dream project. He'd been writing and tweaking it for six years before finally getting it into production. He even storyboarded the entire film himself. Originally, the film revolved around demons possessing humans, but Stewart, being Jewish, decided to put a religious spin and made them all avenging angels. While it was an interesting concept, it wasn't fully fleshed out here, which leads me to some issues I have with the film. In the Gladys scene, we get the impression that she's possessed, but that flies against what we see in the rest of the film. She looks normal and not the black-eyed, shark-toothed version of the possessed folks. Later, we see the little kid disguised as normal to lure Kyle out so he can kill him. If they could do this, why didn't they all just act normal until they got inside the diner and then attack? Another thing they said is the angels can only possess the weak-willed. While Sandra frequently loses her shit and even tries to sacrifice the baby, why didn't anyone possess her? A few other things could have been explained a little better. Why was the ceiling bleeding? How did the demon kid cut off his own thumbs? Why was the angel Gladys cursing up such a storm? Why did only a few of the angels transform into insect-like creatures? Why did the majority of them look like lumbering zombies? Why did the angels only attack in stages? The last thing is the ending. God called for the destruction of man as a test for Michael and Gabriel, as well as to give us humans a good stern warning. Gabriel set about following orders, while Michael flew in the face of God and defied him to prove humanity could be saved. So at the end, when Michael's back from heaven, he explains how he showed God that humans still deserve to live. This can't be. Him. You gave him what he asked for. I gave him what he needed. This obviously is what he wanted since he allowed Michael to return. How come the war is still on? If God was shown that humanity should be allowed to continue, then wouldn't he call off the extermination? All this leads me to believe is that the film was supposed to be longer, but since this was Stewart's first time directing, the studio muscled him into making some cuts. As we all know, stunts and effects are expensive, so when trimming, dialogue is often the first thing to go. The last stand nature of the film is what helped Stewart sell to the studio. Since the majority of it took place in the diner, they could shoot it quickly and cheaply, since there wouldn't be many location changes. I know $26 million is a big deal to most of us, but for an effects-heavy action film released by a major studio, it's pocket change. I would have liked to have seen more of what was happening in other parts of the world, but I guess that was just out of the scope of the production. At least they give us some ideas by having the radio message from a local militia saying that they've been fighting off the angels. And those nitpicks aside, the film still kicked ass. The action scenes were well shot, the characters were effectively creepy, and most of the cast was spot on. Yes, the movie was derivative of other films, mostly The Seventh Sign and The Terminator, but it felt more like lightly borrowing as opposed to blatant theft. The movie has its silly moments, and and I would have liked to have some more of Heaven's motives explained. Beyond that though, I enjoyed it very much. How can you hate a film that has an angel with bulletproof wings that can slice through flesh and wields a mace that spins like a buzzsaw? There's a safety switch on the side of your weapon. You won't be needing it. Push it all the way down two clicks. Now, when this starts, you hold on tight. Otherwise, you're gonna blow your hand off. What the fuck y'all looking at me for? <laughs> 